Hey guys, it's Graham. This is going to be part one of a two-part video on anodizing. Now there's been lots of videos done and posted on YouTube to do with anodizing and I've watched a lot of these and in fact I learnt a lot from uh, watching these. I started anodizing way back oh, probably 10 years ago now um, well before there was very much uh, information available on doing the process especially at home so I basically taught myself and um, I find that it's uh, a very rewarding process especially if you're doing machining in aluminium and you're making components I started off first I had uh, some motorbikes and I was making some aluminium components for my motorbike and I wanted to protect them against the elements. And it was just not possible to do anything using commercial anodizers because you had to have large batches and it was expensive. So I started in a very minor way myself and gradually over the years, I built up to the point where now it's a fairly uh, simple process for me and I wanted to just uh, go through the way I now do my anodizing. Not so much the way I did it in the past, but uh, how I do it these days. First thing you need to actually be aware of is that you're going to be dealing with some fairly corrosive uh, chemicals, acids and uh, sodas and things like that. So. Uh, the first main acid that's used in anodizing is sulfuric acid. I buy this concentrated. This is around 98% um, pure sulfuric acid. This is not battery acid, though batteries do use sulfuric acid. This is bought from a chemical uh, supply company. And um, fortunately uh, in Australia, you or at the time that I bought this, I'm not sure about now, this was a few years ago, you don't need any special license to, uh, to buy uh, this acid from a chemical supply company. Uh, the other main um, top chemical you're going to be using is caustic soda. Um, that's um, readily available at your uh, local supermarket, quite often sold as drain cleaner or that sort of thing. Um, the most important thing you're going to buy and have on hand is uh, bicarbonate of soda, primarily because this is how you neutralize the acid. If you uh, spill it or get it on your hands or something like that, or also for when you're, uh, after you've done the anodizing process or the cleaning process and your component has been in acid, uh, then you'll use a solution of bicarbonate of soda uh, that you're going to dip it into to neutralize the acid on the surface so that it won't contaminate uh, any other chemicals that you put into it. The other thing you're going to be uh, using is um, some sort of heating device. Now you can use jugs or you can be a little bit more sophisticated as uh, I later became and uh, used immersion heating elements. Um, and I made myself up a temperature control box with a um, display on the front that allows me to set a temperature and I can plug in two um, submersible heaters into that. Um, the use that I uh, use this for is when I'm degreasing my, uh, my parts, I use um, a degreaser made by and supplied by Caswell um, and that's uh, heated to a, um, a relatively warm temperature that the components are dipped into for the initial degreasing and you'll see me actually do this when you watch the rest of the video on the process of anodizing that I use. The other part you will need is when you hang your components in the anodizing tank, you're going to be needing some wire to attach to the component to have an electrical connection to, uh, to the positive supply of your uh, power supply. 
and um, you're going to need something that uh, or a wire or a way of connecting it that uh, is going to be impervious and not affected by the acid. Now the uh, most common thing that a lot of people use is aluminium wire which I used to use right at the very early days. The problem is with uh, using aluminium wire um, it's a one-off uh, process because it gets anodized at the same time as the part gets anodized so generally unless you strip it back in uh, caustic soda um, it's a one-time thing so you can only use it once so you'll be buying a bit of this and uh, and uh, using it and then throwing it away so uh, I don't do that anymore the other uh, wire that you can use which is uh, quite easily available on, on the internet or uh, eBay, I buy it online, is titanium wire. And I have various sizes of titanium wire. And uh, this particular pack, it's sold as a one meter pack and it's 0.9 millimeters diameter. I've got thicker wire, which is around 1.2 millimeters in diameter. It's good to have a variety of thicknesses so that you can um, adapt it to whatever uh, hole or the way you're going to uh, secure it to the part that needs to be anodized. Generally, most parts will have a hole in them and um, I use this wire, put a little loop in it and uh, away I go, I just ram it into the hole. Uh, the beauty of titanium wire is it's very springy so you can open it up, push it into the hole and spring back and it'll hold it uh, quite nicely. The other advantage of this is that you can use it hundreds, thousands of times. It never wears out. It doesn't get affected by the acid. It doesn't deteriorate. It can get discoloured, but it'll still make an electrical connection. So I've been using the same pieces of titanium wire now for my anodizing for probably seven or eight years, and I've never had to replace it. So worthwhile investment is titanium wire. So the nice thing about anodizing is the effects you can get is that you can color it red, blue, orange, black is a fairly good favorite one, uh, plain anodizing where it's uh, the natural color. Now one thing you'll notice when you anodize is that um, it might be uh, a shiny piece of uh, aluminium to start with. After the anodizing process, it will dull off a little bit. So the other chemical that you will need, um, and this is if you're going to color your component, is a coloring um, dye. Um, some people have tried fabric coloring dyes that you can get from supermarkets and uh, normal retail outlets. They don't really work, they'll give you a bit of a color, but it's well and truly worthwhile investing in proper dyes that are made for coloring anodized material. I obtained this one from Caswell, and there'll be a link in the description uh, for them. Caswell actually supply complete kits for anodizing. Every, all the parts that you will need generally apart from the acid which you'll have to provide yourself but they they have a range of anodizing dyes so you'll see that anodizing really really works and can really uh, be a great addition if you're uh, doing a bit of machining and making parts in uh, in aluminium is one part here that I made ages ago was the pulley the pulley is red the surrounding for that is black um, it just looks nice. Here's another one which is, um, it was anodized, it's a bearing in the inside. It was anodized uh, a purpley color, probably, I think they call it Bordeaux. Uh, and then I uh, put in the lathe and I machined the outside anodizing layer off so it's silver, so I've got this sort of contrast. Um, I've also uh, done laser engraving on black black anodizing and uh, it looks uh, quite nice when it's uh, laser engraved. This is a black part which will feature in my uh, video. Um, I've made clocks that's plain. The same sort of clock which is 
red anodized, another clock which is clear anodized, bases, all sorts of bits and pieces that I've got around here. So the nice thing is anodizing uh, really works. It can be very frustrating at times uh, if you don't get it quite right and it's a bit of a learning process. It's a bit touch and go. But um, once you've played around with a little bit, once you've got a good setup, once you've done it a little bit um, and learnt, then uh, you'll find it a very rewarding process to go through. So I hope you enjoy the rest of the video. I, I'm sorry it's a little long, but um, I've split it up into two parts. Uh, the first part is just the anodizing process, the preparation, the uh, anodizing and the cleaning and the sealing to end up with a clear finish. The second part of the video is a little bit of that again, but it concentrates mostly on uh, the colouring um, dye process for your components. So um, there you go. I will now uh, finish uh, chatting to you and um, I will run the rest of the so video. This is where I am right at this point in time. I have the parts that I'm going to be anodizing soaking in degreasing solution and they've been doing that for about half an hour now these are the raw parts before that i made sure i cleaned the parts by hand very very carefully and now they're being degreased next to the degreasing solution we have some rinsing water so that i can rinse them off as soon as i take them out the degreasing solution is maintained at a temperature i maintain it at 48 degrees and there is a small temperature probe in here and a little control box that I um, made up myself. The other necessity is to have disposable gloves on hand because you're going to need to swap those over a few times during the process to make sure you don't get fingerprints on the material and aluminium to be anodized and especially you don't want to get acid on your hands because as we move over to this other side of the workbench, this is the main anodizing station, an ultrasonic cleaner, which will be used later on as part of the cleaning process, filtered water. This is where it all happens. This is the main anodizing tank. It contains an, a bath on the inside of sulfuric acid diluted to about 20%. The outer bath contains water that uh, the green colour you see is antifreeze to stop algae from growing up in it. And that water is also able to be circulated down through a refrigeration unit. And this is the sort of refrigeration unit that uh, is used for fishing, fish tanks, uh, for home aquariums and that sort of thing. But in a lot of cases, if you're doing a small job, you don't need to add any cooling. But uh, if you're doing a long job and it's a hot day, then uh, you need to add some cooling to maintain the, uh, the temperature of the acid bath. Up here we have an amp meter because controlling the current flow is very important. And I have a, a temperature monitor there and a probe which goes down into the acid bath. Along further up here, I've got an extraction system to, uh, to remove the fumes and then the power supply, which is the crucial part. And that's uh, currently this particular one here is a maximum of five amps at about 30 volts. You would normally run around about 12 volts and then set the current. It's a current regulated supply. And that's really important because it's all about controlling the current to get the right result for anodizing. If I swing right around here, and you'll notice I've removed my, uh, my car from the garage because I don't want uh, anything to uh, get away with that. And uh, towards the garage door, which will be the second part of the cleaning process, I've got a caustic bath. So the parts will be soaked in caustic soda and then rinsed in um, clear rinsing water and then they'll go into what is called a desmutting bath, which is a mixture of hydrochloric and nitric acid, just a very weak solution. That's just to remove any smut that uh, might be generated by the caustic um, process. 
and uh, following that, that will be rinsed in a bicarbonate of soda bath to make sure all the acid is completely neutralized. So I'll move on and I'll go back to the next bit of the process and, and I'll show you. Parts from the degreasing solution over to the rinsing, just in, in some clear water here, jiggle the parts up and down. The other thing I do is um, I take some water into a syringe because these parts have blind holes in them. I want to make sure that it's I rinse the bottom of the blind holes out completely so I'll poke the syringe into that and I'll give it a, them a bit of a squirt and I'll try and this is a bit hard when I'm it's a lot easier when you're doing it with just one hand so I'll give them all those, those blind holes a bit of a squirt there's only four of them in this particular situation there we go so now I've given them a uh, a squirt and I'll be moving those over to the caustic soda and the uh, desmutting bath. So now the parts are in the caustic soda bath and I'll leave them there for a while, uh, normally about sort of five minutes but I keep checking on them to, uh, to make sure. It's just this all part of the cleaning process because you'll never get a good result anodizing unless the parts are meticulously clean any fingerprints or grease on the parts once it's gone into the actual anodizing bath will show up in the result and you'll never get rid of it so this is the most crucial part of the whole process you'll notice also i'm doing this right near the garage door so that uh, it's well ventilated because caustic soda and aluminium produce hydrogen gas and um, you don't want to be uh, breathing too much of that in. So uh, I uh, always do this part right near the door so it's well ventilated. So I'll take them out of, out of the um, caustic soda and put them into the first rinsing bath after that. And you'll, you probably can't see it, but you might notice there, see one of the, one of the holes there? This is the problem with blind holes, um, is that it collects the uh, caustic soda and it keeps reacting with the aluminium so that um, it won't rinse out properly unless I do what I've done before here and use my syringe to actually blow the blind hole out with um, some more rinsing solution. A bit hard to get at this hole, but I will do it. There you go. And um, now you'll see no bubbles coming out of the hole of any uh, amount anymore. I'll do that again uh, once I've uh, put the camera down so that I make sure it's done perfectly. Now I've spent a bit of time making sure the parts are thoroughly rinsed. I've now put them in the second bath, which is the hydrochloric nitric acid mix. It's only about 5%. Um, acid to uh, to 95% water so uh, it's only a very weak solution but it just brightens the aluminium up and it doesn't need to stay in there for terribly long only just a few minutes and then it will go into the next rinsing bath I never mix rinsing baths every process is a separate clean water rinse it's, uh, it's vitally important that you don't contaminate the, uh, the acids and the caustic soda because they're reusable. I don't have to mix them up every time. I've been using this um, hydrochloric nitric acid mix now for 12 months. The caustic soda is, uh, is the same one that I've been using for 12 months. So I try not to cross-contaminate anything by having separate rinses for every process in my disposable protective gloves because I don't want to touch the aluminium um, and contaminate it with any oil or fingerprints from my hand. And I also don't want to get the acid uh, on my hand because um, acid and skin um, don't mix very well. The parts are now in the bicarbonate of soda solution. And again, I have used my syringe to make sure the uh, blind holes are completely blown out and the bicarbonate um, of soda will neutralize the um, hydrochloric nitric acid mix. From this point on, we'll be, I'll be moving them across to the next bench where 
the anodizing process will soon so start. Moved over to the other bench, and I'm going to give the parts a quick ultrasonic clean, just to make sure everything's removed. Let's start the ultrasonic cleaner up, and um, it doesn't need to be in here long, but it's just I just like to be absolutely right to make sure everything is not What I didn't show you because it was a bit hard to do holding the camera in one hand and doing the other part, but um, you'll notice the uh, copper wire which I was originally using to hang the parts for cleaning and whatever. I have now taken some titanium wire and um, bent it over and um, jammed it into the holes. I, uh, what I do is I got various grades of titanium wire and I put a bit of a curve in it like that which then is opened up and when I push it into one of the holes, especially the, if the hole is threaded like these ones are, it grabs really well and gives a good electrical contact. A lot of people will use aluminium wire, which I did at the start and it's an absolute pain because the aluminium wire also anodizes as well. So you can't use it again unless you strip it of the anodizing to reuse it again. Whereas titanium wire, you can use over and over and over and it won't affect the acid. Um, it's impervious uh, to that and um, it uh, gives a really good electrical contact and it has a really good spring sort of a um, characteristic to it to be able to sort of jam into the holes. I generally find most parts that I ever have to anodize have got some sort of a hole, something you can actually use the wire to, or if it doesn't, it has a place where you can drill a hole um, that's not going to be obvious, but it's a much better way of, uh, of clamping. So what we do now is we take the part, such as this one here, and um, I give it a final rinse in filtered water just to make sure everything's fine. I've also redone um, the, uh, the holes. So this is not normal tap water. You can tell the difference between my normal tap water, which is slightly yellowish, compared to the filtered water, which is really, really clean. And that's just that I'm really, really fussy about making sure everything is perfect before it goes into the anodizing bath. From there, I, I put a, got already got a hook in this one. I move it across to the anodizing bath and I hang the part off one of these rails here. That uh, rail will be connected to the positive line of the power supply, but I'll explain that again as soon as I get the other parts in the bath. So now I can take my rubber gloves off. The uh, parts are actually nicely hung in the bath. Uh, one thing you'll notice, I have uh, air running into the bath to keep it circulated. Um, it's something that not a lot of people do, but uh, it promotes a, a much more even anodizing, uh, which is vitally important if you're going to color this material. So um, it, all it is is basically just a fish um, aerator pump, nothing sophisticated at all, just blowing water. Right at the bottom, it's, it's got a bit of lead wrapped around it just so that it weighs it down. Uh, lead is another thing which is impervious to the acid solution. So the only materials you can really hang in there is the aluminium, which you're going to anodize, titanium, which uh, is impervious to the acid, and uh, lead, which is uh, not going to be affected by the acid. The two plates at, uh, at the end here and here, they are aluminium. Um, because, and they're not going to be affected at all by the acid because, or the anodizing process, because they are connected to the negative supply of the uh, voltage. So um, the current is not going to cause them to be anodized. Only the aluminium parts that are connected to the positive rail of the voltage will be anodized. The negative rail will not be anodizing. 
anyway, uh, what we have got now, I've got these two are joined together by this uh, red wire and this is then going up, this red wire is going up to my uh, positive supply which is uh, then monitored through this uh, current meter because uh, as I said before, the amperage when you're anodizing is very, very important. And um, you'll see my temperature is still pretty good. Nothing to worry about there. Now it comes to setting up the uh, current and voltage. So here's my uh, regulated power supply. But before we actually do that, I'll just take you down here to uh, a spreadsheet that um, I previously used to calculate what uh, current I needed to set based on the surface area of the parts being anodized. Uh, that's uh, a very critical part of the anodizing process. So I made up this spreadsheet myself uh, some years ago, uh, which allowed me to put in uh, different dimensions, uh, the length, the width, um, and the height of uh, the material, and it would calculate what the surface area was, and then calculate the, uh, the current that was required to anodize that for whatever purpose I was going to use it for. So I've got two settings here for color and for natural anodizing, and I'll explain a bit more about that later on. But for the moment, it's telling me I need to set the current to around about 2.1 amps. So I come up here, I've got, uh, I've already preset my voltage to around about 12 and a half to 14 volts. And uh, I'll start to wind up the current limiter and you'll see the voltage is going up and the current is going up. Move across here and this is the actual current going into the bath and I've got this, got to wind that up to around about 2.1. That's pretty much spot on. That's okay, you'll find it will fluctuate a little bit. So as long as it's about 0 0.2, 0 0.3 of an amp either side, it's, uh, it's not going to affect it terribly, terribly much. So uh, basically everything's sort of done now. All I need to do is to set a timer up, which I have here on my bath, though I normally use the one on my phone. Uh, that's already set for 60 minutes and I just start and it'll start counting down. And I know that I've got to leave everything in there for about, uh, about an hour from, from now. So I'll bring you back to the next part of the process when, when you're process. anodizing is, and you can tell by the stream of uh, small uh, gas bubbles coming off the negative plate, but also look closely, and I'm not quite sure whether you can, whether I can get this or not, but uh, you'll see some gas bubbles coming off the actual aluminium parts, which means that they are properly connected. Uh, it's important, uh, Try not to move them around too much because once the parts start to anodize, you don't want the wire to, to move around inside the part because it could move to a non or an anodized uh, section. The thing about um, once a part is anodized, anodizing is an electrical insulator. So um, it won't uh, connect anymore. So now the anodizing timer has gone off and I have moved the parts from the bath into the bicarbonate of soda solution to neutralize the acid and they've been soaking in there now for a few minutes. I have used my syringe again to uh, blow out the, uh, and make sure there's no acid still left in the blind holes. So now I'll be moving this upstairs to where I'm going to seal the anodizing. Right, so here we are in the kitchen and I'm going to take the parts uh, here and uh, give them a good rinse and I'll leave them dangling across there for the moment and I'll rinse all the parts again. Now if for instance I was going to color these parts I'd probably take a bit more um, attention to uh, to the rinsing process but I'm not going to colour them, I'm going to leave them natural, so uh, not so important to be too concerned about the, uh, the rinsing. This is just plain tap water. What I uh, sometimes do, I'll use filtered water to give them um, 
an even extra rinse, but I will use my syringe again to, uh, to blow out the holes to make sure they're all done. And then we take them from this tank and the next process is to seal the aluminium. It's quite simple. It's just boiling water. So put them over here. This was boiling. I'll wind the gas up a bit more to, uh, to get it back to boiling again. And uh, I'll take these other parts. I use I use wood as my support for this because that way I can lift it up and jiggle it around and it's not going to burn my hands getting, getting hot. So here we go. That's going to be make sure the parts are covered. Now this part isn't, isn't completely covered so I'm going to just loosen that wire off uh, and um, lower it further down into the boiling water. Or I'll just add, no, I'll, I'll do it the easy way. I'll just add some more um, water to that. So I'll be back in a second when I've got that done and the water's nice and boiling. So I set my timer for half an hour and um, this is basically what you want. I apologize, it's, my overhead light is uh, LED, which gives us like everything like a bluey tinge. If I turn it off, it looks a little bit better. Um, take the top off. This is basically what you want. You want it boiling, but not out of control boiling, just a nice boil. So that's uh, bubbling away really well. I'm gonna wind the gas back a little bit. Again, as you see, I use wood and um, I place the lid on. It sits nicely across the, the wooden supports. And uh, basically I'll just wait for the timer to go off and then I'll take the parts out and I will clean them. Hopefully the next uh, pass I do tomorrow, I will uh, perhaps color them and I'll show you what the coloring process is. But for now, I'm just gonna let that boil until the timer goes off and um, I'll show you what they look like when they come out. Back to you soon. So this is into the boiling process and sealing process. You can see there's only around about two minutes or so left to go. And you'll notice that the way I set the temperature for the water to boil is just so that there's a ripple on the surface, not heavily boiling, not aggressive, just a nice little soft ripple on the surface. Then you know you've got the right sort of temperature. The other important thing is to recheck and make sure that the components are completely covered by the water and nothing is exposed above the water line. Otherwise, you will get a stain mark on the anodized aluminium that you won't be able to remove. So just keep monitoring it and making sure it's okay. I'll soon be waiting for the timer to go off and I'll be removing Parts. Okay, here we go. Time has gone off. So we will wind the gas back, take the lid off, stop this noise, put that aside. So here we do, we have the parts. Now what I'm going to do is start the tap running over here and I'll take them out one at a time. Wire is not too hot so that I'm not going to scold myself. Move it over and just cool it off under the tap and put that one side on the towel take the next part here we go cool it off and a bit of a cool under the cold tap i could have filled up a little container and made a bath to drop it in but uh, what the heck i'm in the, in the kitchen and everything's on hand so there we go. Now, the secret is we take this and if I can do it all in one, I can pull the wire out. Oops, turn the water off first. And uh, you can see 
the part is lovely anodized. You can see it's changed colour from the original. It's got a nice anodized uh, feeling to it. It's uh, it's perfect. So I'll just put the camera down for a second and give it a wipe and show you again with it. These are the parts all wiped and finished. You can tell it's a nice even anodized coating. There is no staining anywhere. The, the, you could tell by the feel of it that it's got a slightly sort of soapy sort of a feel to it but um, it's now fully protected finger marks fingerprints won't stain it much much nicer than uh, than raw aluminium and um, if for instance a point if I hadn't of uh, cleaned out these holes properly with the syringe uh, the effect that you can get is that when uh, you boil it and and do the uh, final anodizing, you can get staining, and you would see staining occurring down from the, the screw where whatever was left in there, like a bit of acid or something like that, had uh, affected the surface of the aluminium. And you can see there's none of that there. Now, that wouldn't have really mattered with this particular part because that's going to attach like this so this whole assembly is going to look like this when it's finally done if I sit there so that's uh, that's it for now so for most parts these days I just use natural um, anodizing and it just gives a bit of a nicer finish